everybody, welcome back to the channel. Okay, today's gonna be a little bit of a different video, so if you don't wanna watch it, I totally understand. It's not a market update. It's not really going super deep into investigative journalism about Palantir. It's actually combining the things that I've done in my past with some of my uh, passions in the moment and in, in, in the present day. So, I did debate in high school. I did competitive debate. Uh, and competitive debate, I know it sounds really nerdy, but basically you go to a bunch of tournaments and you argue against other people and you have to get a judge at the back of the room to vote for you. And the more you get ballots and the more the judge votes for you, the more you get to win and go advance at the tournament. Uh, by the end of my senior year, I ended up doing pretty well. Uh, I was on the National USA debate team, so I was one of nine people represented to represent the United States of America. Um, and we traveled across the world, Croatia, Slovenia, Germany, and we did international debate. I was the third best public speaker in Europe and seventh best debater in the United States at the end of 2016. Uh, I'll leave some links in the description if you guys want to check this, check that stuff out. So, like, I did debate in high school. Uh, it's where I learned my communication skills. It's where I learned my public speaking skills. And right now, on the side, outside of some of the content and stuff that I'm doing and some and the startup that I run, I have a consulting firm where I teach other people how to be better public speakers, communicators, debaters. Uh, I work with some corporations, their employees, et cetera, et cetera. So one of the things I want to do today, and people have been asking for this video because uh, because I, I mentioned this in, in some other videos before, is a speech analysis. And I've been doing this for like literally the past 10 years of my life is analyzing a speech, giving feedback, and talking about the body language of the speech, the, the, the structure of the argument the person is making, how the content actually flows. It's really interesting stuff to me. I know it's kind of nerdy, but if you you've ever wanted to get better at public speaking or communication or just your like general argumentative skills because obviously if you have those skills you have a little bit more influence because you have the ability to communicate which is obviously a very effective thing it's important for every job that you do um then it is something interesting to, to kind of go deep into shyam sanker is the chief operating officer of palantir and what i really thought would be interesting is if i could analyze a ted talk that he did i think eight or nine years ago back in 2012 2013 and the name of this ted talk is called the rise of the human computer cooperation i have never watched this ted talk before so this is gonna be my reaction on the first time watching it i'm super excited to analyze this because a i'm gonna be analyzing shyam who's way more successful and cooler than i am from a public speaking you know perspective and uh give my criticism give my feedback it'll be kind of interesting to see but i also want to hear his argument right i want to see how he how he convinces an argument this is the you know number four number five dude of palantir it's a very important guy so because this channel is covering palantir covering the market covering stocks uh, i thought it would be a really cool way to combine the interests of public speaking and communication and analyzation towards someone who hopefully will better help us understand their own internal motivations for why they're at Palantir. That's kind of the takeaway I want it to be at the end of this video. So without further ado, let's get into this TED talk and let's see what's going on. I'd like to tell you about two games of chess. The first happened in 1997, in which Garry Kasparov, a human, lost to Deep Blue, a machine. To many, this was the dawn of a new era one where man would be dominated by machine. But here we are, 20 years on, and the greatest change in how we relate to computers is the iPad, not how. The second game was a freestyle chess tournament in 2005, in which man and machine could enter together as partners rather than adversaries, if they so chose. At first, the results were predictable. Even a supercomputer was beaten by a grandmaster with a relatively weak laptop. The surprise came at the end. Who won? Not a grandmaster with a supercomputer, but actually two American amateurs using three relatively weak laptops. Their ability to coach and manipulate their computers to deeply explore specific positions effectively counteracted the superior chess knowledge of the grandmasters and the superior computational power of other adversaries. This is an astonishing result. Average men. Okay, so first thing we're gonna start off is his introduction. The first 30, 45 seconds of a speech, you wanna get people's attention, right? You wanna hook them. You wanna be able to say something that's meaningful to get people to care about what you have to say. And in order to get people to care about what you have to say, you have to say something interesting. And one of the most interesting things you can do is set up a pseudo cliffhanger, which is like, you start off with a story and that story starts attributing something at the end, which is gonna be the payoff. And if order for people to get the value of the story or the value of your communication of the story, they have to wait till the payoff. The key here is can you get them interested enough to care about the payoff? Because then if they care about that first 40, uh, payoff that comes at 45 seconds at the beginning of your speech, they're willing to listen to the next three, four minutes, and then hopefully willing to listen to the next final 10 minutes about what you have to say. So he starts off by saying, look, there's these two stories I want you to tell about, or two chess masters I want you to t I want to tell you about. There's a visual aid, which is always good when you're, when you're presenting, because then people can sort of follow along visually. And he sort of puts this dynamic or dichotomy between man versus computer. And then ultimately there's a conclusion at the end of what ends up happening. And average machines beating the best man, the best machine. And anyways, isn't it supposed to be man versus machine? 
Instead, it's about cooperation and the right type of cooperation. We've been paying a lot of attention to Marvin Minsky's vision for artificial intelligence over the last 50 years. It's a sexy vision for sure. Many have embraced it. It's become the dominant school of thought in computer science. But as we enter the era of big data, of network systems, of open platforms and embedded technology, I'd like to suggest it's time to reevaluate an alternative vision that was actually developed around the same time. All right, so what he's doing here, he's bringing in some science, which is definitely very important. Uh, and he is a computer guy, right? So he's talking about the nature of artificial intelligence. Already the nature of the speech is that I think there should be an alternative way for us to think about these things because it's not man versus human, or sorry, a man versus computer. It is a cooperative mechanism in which man and computer work together to hopefully uh, achieve better results. So he's suggesting there is a different way we should think about these things. And now that gets me more interested from a public speaking communication perspective because I'm like, all right, what's the different way to think about this given it's not the dominant perspective? Um, that we're going to go for. I'm talking about JCR Licklider's human-computer symbiosis, perhaps better termed intelligence augmentation, IA. Licklider was a computer science titan who had a profound effect on the development of technology and the internet. His vision was to enable man and machine to cooperate in making decisions and controlling complex situations without the inflexible dependence on predetermined programs. Note that word, cooperate. Licklider encourages us not to take a toaster and make it data from Star Trek, but to take a human and make her more capable. Humans are so amazing, how we think, our nonlinear approaches, our creativity, iterative hypotheses, all very difficult if possible at all for computers to do. Licklider intuitively realized this, contemplating humans, setting the goals, formulating the hypotheses, determining the criteria, and performing the evaluation. Of course, in other ways, humans are so limited, we're terrible at scale, computation, and volume. We require high-end talent management to keep the rock band together and playing. Licklider foresaw computers doing all of the routinizable work that was required to prepare the way for insights and decision-making. So this is really cool. First of all, he says decision-making. Palantir is a data-driven decision-making uh, software that helps you better make decisions. So already we kind of see hints of, of what he's getting at here in terms of how computers can work with humans. Um, but he's setting up this dichotomy, right? That there is a symbiotic relationship in which humans and computers need to operate with each other. And humans are good at really interesting creative tasks in terms of figuring out how to solve problems that are hard, but then the actual routine work that we need to get done and the actual like computational part of solving it, we're really not that good at because our brains can't run as fast as calculators can. So he's setting up this symbiotic relationship by still making a, 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 a sort of line in the sand between what humans can do and what computers can't do, which is setting us up to think, okay, what's going to, what's going to be the conclusion uh, as a result of setting up this dichotomy. Silently, without much fanfare, this approach has been compiling victories beyond chess. Protein folding, a topic that shares the incredible expansiveness of chess. There are more ways of folding a protein than there are atoms in the universe. This is a world-changing problem with huge implications for our ability to understand and treat disease. And for this task, supercomputer fueled brute force simply isn't enough. Fold It, a game created by computer scientists, illustrates the value of the approach. Non-technical, non-biologist amateurs play a video game in which they visually arrange the structure of the protein, allowing the computer to manage the atomic forces and interactions and identify structural issues. This approach beats supercomputers 50% of the time and tied 30% of the time. Foldit recently made a notable and major scientific discovery by deciphering the structure of the Mason fissure monkey virus, a protease that had eluded determination for over 10 years, was solved by three players in a matter of days perhaps the first major scientific advance to come from playing the video game. Last year, on the site of the Twin Towers, the 9-11 memorial opened. It displays the names of the thousands of victims using a beautiful concept called meaningful adjacency. It places the names next to each other based on their relationships to one another, friends, families, coworkers. When you put it all together, it's quite a computational challenge. 3,500 victims, 1,800 adjacency requests, the importance of the overall physical specifications, and the final aesthetics. That's a really good point, man. Like that 9-11 example makes sense. If you, That is a complicated data-driven task. You have a limited amount of space, but you want the aesthetics of it to make sense and you need these names to be placed in a particular position. Otherwise, there's literally no point of it. How do you do that, right? And, and, and there's human in, ingenuity involved in creating that to make sense, but there's also a lot of computational power that probably has to go into that. So, it, so this is a good example from a communication perspective. I mean, this is a this is an example that illustrates the problem of what's going on, uh, and there's a better understanding of, of of when you understand the depth of how hard the problem is to solve. 
for people to get why he's bringing it up. Now, the one thing I would criticize here is a little bit, he's got to be a little bit more energetic. He's, he's talking very stale. He's kind of walking very stale. Um, you know, you can he's kind of just like going from part to part to part of his presentation. I would add a little bit more humor, a little bit more jokes, just to be a little bit more natural here. But obviously, it's very hard when you're on like a TED stage. When first reported by the media, full credit for such a feat was given to an algorithm from the New York City design firm Local Projects. The truth is a bit more nuanced. While an algorithm was used to develop the underlying framework, humans used that framework to design the final result. So in this case, a computer evaluated millions of possible layouts, managed a complex relational system, and kept track of a very large set of, of measurements and variables, allowing the humans to focus on design and compositional choices. So the more you look around you, the more you see Licklider's vision everywhere. Whether it's augmented reality in your iPhone or GPS in your car, human-computer symbiosis is making us more capable. So if you want to improve human-computer symbiosis, what can you do? You can start by designing the human into the process. Instead of thinking about what a computer will do to solve the problem, design the solution around what the human will do as well. When you do this, you'll quickly realize that you spend all of your time on the interface between man and machine, specifically on designing away the friction in the interaction. In fact, this friction is more important than the power of the man or the power of the machine in determining overall capability. That's why two amateurs with a few laptops handily beat a supercomputer and a grandmaster. What Kasparov calls process is a byproduct of friction. The better the process, the less the friction. And minimizing friction turns out to be the decisive variable. Or take another example, big data. Every interaction we have in the world is recorded by an ever-growing array of sensors. Your phone, credit card, computer. The result is big data. And it actually presents us with an opportunity to more deeply understand the human condition. The major emphasis of most approaches to big data focus on how do I store this data? How do I search this data? How do I process this data? These are necessary but insufficient questions. The imperative is not to figure out how to compute, but what to compute. How do you impose human intuition on data at this scale? This is where we're getting the Palantir stuff coming in. I mean, this makes a lot of sense, right? The question is not what to compute. The question is how to compute, but what do we compute? We have all this data. So it's not a question of how we do it. Like, that's kind of the easy part. It's a question of applying human ingenuity and creativity towards uh, figuring out what to do. And this has always been Palantir's mission, right? It's not to replace humans with uh, data-driven decision-making software, but rather to help humans. That's why they're really big on their platform being no-code or low-code. Uh, Non-technical people are, really, are able to use it in a meaningful way so that... It's a good experience for everyone using this software and they're able to make better decisions with this data. So already back in 2013 or where, whenever this talk was, we're seeing the integration of his mindset about how big data will play a massive role for companies, organizations, governments, and consumers in the next 10, 20 years. Uh, and he's sort of defining what needs to be done about that problem. Again, we start by designing the human into the process. When PayPal was first starting as a business, their biggest challenge was not how do I send money back and forth online? It was, how do I do that without being defrauded by organized crime? Why so challenging? Because while computers can learn to detect and identify fraud based on patterns, they can't learn to do that based on patterns they've never seen before. And organized crime has a lot in common with this audience. Brilliant people, relentlessly resourceful, entrepreneurial spirit, <laughs> and one huge and important difference, purpose. And so while computers alone can catch all but the cleverest fraudsters, catching the cleverest is the difference between success and failure. There's a whole class of problems like this, ones with adaptive adversaries. They rarely, if ever, present with the repeatable pattern that's discernible to computers. Instead, there's some inherent component of innovation or disruption, and increasingly, these problems are buried in big data. For example, terrorism. Terrorists are always adapting in minor and major ways to new circumstances. And despite what you might see on TV, these adaptations and the detection of them are fundamentally human. Computers don't detect novel patterns and new behaviors. Or humans do. Humans using technology, testing hypotheses, searching for insight by asking machines to do things for them. Osama bin Laden was not caught by artificial intelligence. He was caught by dedicated, resourceful, brilliant people in partnerships with various technologies. I think that's a dig of him saying that, and Palantir was uh, kind of involved, but I can't say that publicly. But yeah, this, start, this stuff is starting to make a lot of sense, and hopefully it's giving a better understanding of the investment in Palantir, right? It's actually, you know, again, I never saw this before, so understanding from a chief operating officer's perspective of how you think about the world and how you think about how complex the world will become, technology is at the forefront of human ingenuity. I know I keep saying that word, but it just, it just means like humans' abilities to figure out how to solve problems while technology is aiding them can be a really big market. Like it's infinitely scalable because there's infinite amount of use cases for it, uh, which is why kind of he's operating a volunteer. 
As appealing as it might sound, you cannot algorithmically data mine your way to the answer. There is no find terrorist button. And the more data we integrate from a vast variety of sources across a wide variety of data formats from very disparate systems, the less effective data mining can be. Instead, people will have to look at data and search for insight. And as Licklider foresaw long ago, the key to great results here is the right type of cooperation. And as Kasparov realized, that means minimizing friction at the interface. Now, this approach makes possible things like combing through all available data from very different sources, identifying key relationships, and putting that in one place, something that's been nearly impossible to do before. To some, this has terrifying privacy and civil liberties implications. To others, it foretells of an era of greater privacy and civil liberties protections. But That's a big point here, right? Privacy and civil liberties, he's making the, like, so from, from a debating perspective, what he's doing here, he's trying to highlight the biggest concern that's going to exist. So when you introduce an argument and your argument is like decently good, right, and it has a good, and it has a good value um, to, to the audience, there's always going to be some skepticism of the argument, right? So if I'm like, you know, you should always eat healthy. The biggest concern to that is like, well, what if there's some days where I feel really bad and I want to have like a cheat meal, right? So like, what is your response to the biggest refutation or the rebuttal that someone has and that you know they're going to have in the audience, given it's kind of like the elephant in the room? So his argument is like, yes, we need to mine through data. We need to understand this stuff. We need to have a lot of complex algorithms, all of this stuff. But he subtly is like, I know you're thinking about this civil liberties problem and privacy because that's obviously a big issue. And he obviously wants to address that because you can't say your talk can't be called the rise of human co computer cooperation without actually being able to um, answer the question of how computers, once they get really advanced, and the humans that are running those computers, how to make sure they don't turn evil against other humans, which we've seen time and time again, and which we've seen happen uh, in a lot of different companies that have not protected civil liberties. Privacy and civil liberties are of fundamental importance that must be acknowledged, and they can't be swept aside even with the best of intents. So let's explore through a couple of examples the impact that technologies built to drive human-computer symbiosis have had in recent time. In October 2007, U.S. and coalition forces raided an al-Qaeda safe house in the city of Sinjar on the Syrian border of Iraq. They found a treasure trove of documents, 700 biographical sketches of foreign fighters. These foreign fighters had left their families in the Gulf, the Levant, and North Africa to join al-Qaeda in Iraq. These records were human resource forms. The foreign fighters filled them out as they joined the organization. It turns out that Al-Qaeda, too, is not without its bureaucracy. <laughs> That's a very funny joke, <laughs> right? Like, the fact that Al-Qaeda did all this human processing uh, paperwork to be able to get people to join their organization has just as much bureaucracy as the, the federal government. They answered questions like, who recruited you? What's your hometown? What occupation do you seek? And that last question, a surprising insight was revealed. The vast majority of foreign fighters were seeking to become suicide bombers for martyrdom. Hugely important since between 2003 and 2007, Iraq had 1,382 suicide bombings, a major source of instability. Analyzing this data was hard. The originals were sheets of paper in Arabic that had to be scanned and translated. The friction in the process did not allow for meaningful results in an operational time frame using humans, PDFs, and tenacity alone. The researchers had to lever up their human minds with technology to dive deeper, to explore non-obvious hypotheses. And in fact, insights emerged. 20% of the foreign fighters were from Libya. 50% of those from a single town in Libya. Hugely important since prior statistics put that figure at 3%. It also helped to hone in on a figure of rising importance in Al-Qaeda, Abu Yaha al-Libi, a senior cleric in the Libyan Islamic Fighting Group. In March of 2007, he gave a speech after which there was a surge in participation amongst Libyan foreign fighters. Perhaps most clever of all, though, and least obvious, by flipping the data on its head, the researchers were able to deeply explore the coordination networks in Syria that were ultimately responsible for receiving and transporting the foreign fighters to the border. These were networks of mercenaries, not ideologues, who were in the coordination business for profit. For example, they charged Saudi foreign fighters substantially more than Libyans, money that would have otherwise gone to al-Qaeda. Perhaps the adversary would disrupt their own network if they knew they were cheating would be jihadists. In January 2010, a devastating 7.0 earthquake struck Haiti. Third deadliest earthquake of all time, left one million people, 10% of the population, homeless. One seemingly small aspect of the overall relief effort became increasingly important as the delivery of food and water started rolling. January and February are the dry months in Haiti, yet many of the camps had developed standing water. The only institution with detailed knowledge of Haiti's floodplains had been leveled in the earthquake, leadership inside. So the question is, which camps are at risk? How many people are in these camps? What's the timeline for flooding? And given very limited resources infrastructure, how do we prioritize the relocation? 
This is a really, really good two examples, right? So the first example about uh, Al Qaeda and Syria, really good data integ integration to be able to figure out um, how to put a stop to this, how to understand the networks that are causing mercenaries to be able to get a profit off of recruiting people and then and then transporting them. Like that stuff is really hard to do, and like using data and computer analysis to figure out the answers to those questions that humans have to ask, right? It's not how to answer the question. It's what question to ask in the first place is incredibly important. And then same thing with this Haiti example. He's giving example after example that's really going back and proving the point. In debate, when you set up an argument, you have to have warrants and logical reasons why your argument makes sense. And a structure for an argument is a claim warrant impact. Claim is what your argument is. Warrant is why your argument is true. Impact is why your argument matters. So I think really towards the end of the speech, he's gonna he's he has already and he's gonna finish wrapping up why this stuff is so important, why human computer cooperation matters. All of these examples pseudo function as warrants because they prove the logic for why this stuff matters, but they also function as impacts because they're showing look if we don't cooperate with these technologies in a meaningful way, um, then we would never be able to solve these these you know hu uh, humanitarian problems that exist uh, and keep the world safer and more effective and 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 potentially. Give a lot more prosperity to people because they have data to drive their The data was incredibly disparate. The U.S. Army had detailed knowledge for only a small section of the country. There was data online from a 2006 environmental risk conference. Others geospatial data, none of it integrated. The human goal here was to identify camps for relocation based on priority need. The computer had to integrate a vast amount of geospatial information, social media data, and relief organization information to answer this question. By implementing a superior process, what was otherwise a task for 40 people over three months became a simple job for three people in 40 hours. All victories for human-computer symbiosis. We're more than 50 years into Licklider's vision for the future, and the data suggests that we should be quite excited about tackling this century's hardest problems, man and machine, in cooperation together. Thank you. All right, that's it. That's our boy, Shyam Sankar. I loved it. I thought it was a great talk. Gave a lot of analysis. From a public speaking perspective, it was awesome. A little bit stale. The guy was a little bit kind of uptight. I think he needed to move around a little bit and just relax a little bit and kind of um, have a little bit more jokes in there. The jokes did seem like they were timed jokes, which are jokes nonetheless, but you know, it could have been a little bit more natural. But overall, the argument was phenomenal. I mean, this argument was a really good argument. And as a Palantir shareholder and Palantir investor, again, I really didn't watch this talk before I analyzed it. Um, it gives you a better understanding of why these technologies are valuable and you start to really understand unlimited amounts of use cases when it comes to terrorists when it comes to humanitarian efforts and obviously when it comes to companies in the commercial sector really being able to integrate these um technology platforms within the disparate data that they have to make it centralized and then make sense of it and then do something it sounds super simple it's like we have data we don't know what to do with it but as you can tell right these challenges are complex. I think the best example was this 9-11 example, which is like, we have a set amount of space, we have these things, they have to be aesthetic, they have to be in relationship to each other in a meaningful way, and how do we figure out how to do that, right? So we asked the right question, but now we have to actually get this to be done, and what Palantir is doing is they're creating a really you know, phenomenal technology to do that at scale for organizations highly customizable to their need um, in, in a variety of ways. Right? And I love that at the end, you know, he ends off with this example and it kind of relates back to the stuff he said in the beginning, which was this whole um, idea of a human facing a machine in one of the most iconic chess, ma chess matches of all time. If you haven't seen that, you should like Google it. It's like really interesting stuff with Gary Kasparov uh, actually facing a, a chess machine. So he started off the speech with this idea of humans and computers going against each other in the context of which one's more smarter. And then he ended it off with how they have to cooperate in order to work together to actually solve the world's biggest issues. So those are my thoughts on his TED Talk. Let me know what you guys think. Let me know if you guys enjoyed it. Thank you guys for watching and I will see you in the next one.